And of course, if we add one more p orbital into the mix, so sp3, now at this point, we're 75% p, right? We've got four simple AOs total, and three of them are p orbitals, so we're 75% p, so we're even higher in energy, sp3. So what you should expect from this and what you should recognize is that electrons in these orbitals will get more and more reactive as we go up in energy. So the sp3 electrons, as I've noted here, are high energy, relatively reactive electrons, whereas the sp2 and sp electrons are lower in energy, with sp being the lowest and sp2 coming in somewhat higher. So when we think about electrons in those orbitals, particularly in the context of anions, right, and, and actual reactive lone pairs being in those orbitals. That helps us explain why, for instance, a negatively charged carbon that is sp3 hybridized will be a lot more reactive than a negatively charged carbon that is, for instance, sp hybridized, like so. Because that lone pair here is in an sp orbital, I would encourage you to figure that out on your own by noting that we have we need two electron we have two electron pair domains here and so we need two either sigma bonds or lone pairs hence sp hybridization and for the reasons I've outlined here the sp orbital is lower in energy so those electrons are less reactive and the anion of the sp3 hybridized carbon is much more reactive because of that sp3 hybrid right there so that's the essence of hybridization. Um, the wiki has more information for you on hybridization if you're, if you're more curious or you feel like I didn't give a very detailed explanation. And uh, I would encourage you to work through examples um, when you get a chance. Hybridization is a concept that can be easily applied to a variety of examples. So, you know, take a molecule like, oh, I don't know, um, let's see, cinnamyl alcohol, for instance, and see if you can go through and identify the hybridization of the carbon atoms in cinnamyl alcohol based on their number of electron pair domains and the number of sigma bonds or lone pairs they have uh, attached to them. All right, now I'm going to switch gears and start talking about resonance. So. What we've seen up to this point is that we can represent molecules as Lewis structures. And we can talk about Lewis structures in terms of looking at the formal charges and thinking about, well, those are probably going to be the reactive atoms. And we can sort of correlate between the Lewis structures and molecular orbitals by thinking about, well, OK, a line typically represents a single bond. If, there are, if there's more than one line, the second and third lines are typically represented as pi bonds overlap between two adjacent p orbitals, and lone pairs will typically be in non-bonding hybrid orbitals. So, you know, we could quickly and easily identify the hybridization, for instance, in this structure of every atom, and in this structure of every atom. But the question is, are these two molecules the same compound or different compounds? And you might look at this and naively say, well, clearly they're different compounds because they have different Lewis structures. But the tricky thing is, is that the sigma structures of both are the same. And we can imagine simply moving pi electrons in these structures to interconvert them. I'll say more about this in a second, but, in, in a second, but uh, for now, just kind of meditate on this idea that these compounds may be, or these Lewis structures, I should say, may be somehow interrelated. One thing we can spot in both of these structures is a potential intramolecular orbital interaction. So, um, so what we can see is that there is the potential for an intramolecular orbital interaction between a lone pair and an empty pi antibonding orbital. So if I draw this out a little bit more pers of a perspective view, I'm just going to draw the O and imagine this bond kind of coming out at you and then sort of going back into the page, and there's the carbon of the CH2 group. 
In this left-hand structure, we can imagine a pi antibonding orbital right here, right? And that would look something like this. And now we have relatively reactive um, electrons here that we can imagine interacting with that empty, whoops, those phases should be opposite. There we go. And we can imagine a lone pair on the oxygen actually interacting in a pi type fashion with the pi star orbital. That would be for this structure here. And you can imagine a similar situation for the structure on the left if we just switch the carbon and oxygen. So putting the carbon on the left and the oxygen over here, now we have a carbon oxygen pi star and the lone pair on carbon can interact there with that pi star orbital. So the Lewis structures aren't telling us the whole story here because they're not taking into account these really sort of key orbital interactions. And you can see just from our discussion of hybridization that there's some vague stuff here, right? What's the hybridization, for instance, of the carbon, the CH2 carbon here? Well, if we look here, then it's clearly sp3 we have a lone pair, a sigma bond there, and then two carbon-hydrogen sigma bonds, not shown. But that's definitely sp3. But here, it looks sp2. Got an electron pair domain there, and then two CH sigma bonds. So it looks sp2 there. So which is it, sp3 or sp2? If we think about that orbital interaction that I just had up, we would see that for optimal overlap with the pi star orbital, we would want that lone pair to be in a p orbital. That way those orbitals line up perfectly, whereas the hybrid, the sp3 hybrid, is going to be kind of pointed off maybe this way a little bit. Putting it in a p orbital actually aligns it perfectly for overlap. Right, so we would actually, in fact, expect that to be sp2 hybridized. So as it turns out, a given sigma framework and number of electrons is enough to define the molecular structure of a compound. In other words, both of those structures are two representations of the same thing, the same compound. If we independently generated these, we would find that they behave in exactly the same way. And the reason why is they have the same set of molecular orbitals. Those orbital interactions that we saw on the last slide, which you can look at in more detail on the wiki. The wiki talks about this in more detail. But those two drawings are actually representations of the exact same thing. Uh, they're both the enolate of acetaldehyde. Because the orbital interaction is what interconverts the two, right? So you can imagine the orbital interaction would sort of delocalize the electrons on the carbon into a pi bond, and because we're donating into a pi star or antibonding orbital, we would kick electrons up to the oxygen, and that actually interconverts the two resonance structures. Chemists use this curved arrow notation to represent <clears throat> excuse me, the movement of electrons in chemical reactions and orbital interactions for resonance structures. So these two molecules are resonance structures. They're two representations of the same compound, and neither of them is exactly right, but some linear combination of the two is the actual structure of the molecule. So to show these interactions, to show the lone pair interacting with the pi star orbital, we draw a double-headed arrow where the two, the f or the full-headed arrow where we have a full head to represent the movement of a pair of electrons, and then we do the same here to show these two electrons on the oxygen, uh, between the carbon and oxygen, I should say, in the pi bonding orbital, moving towards oxygen to form a lone pair.